Welcome to Reddit Q&A number six. I am here with Chris, uh, R. and I, of course, am Josh, and uh, yeah, we're going to answer some questions from the Reddit r slash cooperatives page. Um, we've only got a few this month. Seems like there's been a lot more discussion on the uh, the subreddit this month as compared to uh, questions, but we're going to answer the few that uh, that we did get. Um, so, number one, Brewing Cooperative. How can I make my pipe dream happen? Cherenuka asks or writes, I've uh, had a head fantasy for a while. A small brewery owned, managed, and operated by the workers. Proudly worker-owned, labeled on the can. It wouldn't be the first worker-owned brewery. Many already exist. Currently, I have no means of making it happen. I am not a wealthy person, and I don't know much about brewing, but I plan to take a brewmaster course to get started. I have some marketing and accounting education under my belt, but that was a long time ago. I live in Canada around the Niagara region. I don't know much about cooperatives, how they're started, how they're managed, how ownership is shared, how the initial capital is raised, how decisions are made, how work is allocated. I was hoping to get some insight. If anyone has experiences with cooperatives and would like to share some knowledge, I'd be really happy for that. This is something I don't ever expect to happen. And if it doesn't, it won't be. And if it does, it won't be for a long time, but it would be a dream come true. So, um, interesting comment. One thing I'll say, like this always, uh, and this has come up in groups where I've been um, involved with, you know, talking about starting a co-op and people will have an idea for something that they want to do, uh, but they don't actually have any experience at all doing it. Um, so, you know, the, uh, I want to start a brewery co-op, but I don't know much about brewing immediately. Like, okay, that might be an issue. You're going to take a brewmaster course to get started. That's, that's good. You, you know, probably know about brewing. Uh, but this is actually, what he kind of immediately saves it for me is saying, I have some marketing and accounting education under my belt. It was a long time ago, whatever. You still have that. And that those two skills are both highly, highly important for any business and as, you know, and for worker co-ops, um, certainly for a brewery. And so um, I would say, you know, those are the, you know, skills I would guess you're probably going to be bringing to the co-op and you might want to be, finding somebody who already knows about the brewing side of it. Um, right. To, so it's, you know, everybody kind of contributes what they've already got. Um, and that way you, you move along a lot uh, quicker, but again, that marketing and accounting, not many people have that skill set, and even fewer people, you know, want to actually, you know, employ it. Uh, so if, if those are things that, that you can do for uh, the business, that's a, a huge leg up. Um, you're in Canada. It's great. They have a worker cooperative uh, federation, the uh, Canada, Canadian Worker Co-op Federation, CWCF. And um, I, in the comments, I've already put a link to them for uh, uh, Chiranuka uh, to check out. Um, and they are definitely the people in Canada who you want to be getting in contact with um, and checking out their website for you know, resources, they are the go-to spot if you're in Canada, because it's all going to be very Canada specific. Um, and, you know, finally, just on this, you know, don't ever expect it to happen. But if it does, it won't be for a long time. Uh, don't be so, you know, pessimistic about things. You never know. Start throwing around ideas, talking about it with your friends, um, you know, hanging out with people who are into brewing already. Um, you know, when you're doing your brewmaster course, start talking people up. You never know. Things can happen quick. So uh, keep an open mind is what I would say. Chris, anything? Um, I was looking at their their membership, see if there's any, the Canadian Worker Co-op Federation, see if there's any um, mm -hmm. breweries. They added this and I, I kind of feel bad. I don't know if I'm somehow doxing any, I'm not really doxing anybody, but only post author and moderators are supposed to be able to see this. So um, everybody's getting the insights as well. 
uh, don't pay too much attention to those. Sorry, Chris. Anyway, there's a, uh, I, I see there's a London Brewing Cooperative. Hmm. Um, it's a member of that Canadian worker co-op. Maybe get some, get some peer support. Mm -hmm. But um, oh, there, there's two. I think the, there's another one called Together We're Bitter Cooperative. That's a good name. Um, yeah, go for that peer support. Yeah. It sounds uh, like they're willing to do uh, a lot in the co-op that they want to form. Um, well, oh, the other thing I didn't mention, yeah, they, they actually do obviously have a very good idea as to what is involved, right, in running and what they need to know about. So that's great. Like, you already know the right questions to ask. How do you start them? How they're managed? Ownership is shared, initial capital. Um, again, all this stuff, of course, can be answered by the Canadian Worker Co-op Federation. They have the appropriate resources, but uh, but yeah, it's great to it's great to see that because it's like okay, you already know that there's a whole lot of different things involved. So good place to be in. Better than thinking, you know, there's only a few aspects to it, and I already know about them. <laughs> That would be cool if, if uh, they could be the seat of uh, one that other co-ops could, could support to get off the ground if he's working closely with some other breweries. Um, I doubt that someone could, you know, who knows, maybe there's job opportunities with these co-ops. And... That is that is always, yeah, another good thing to do. Um, if, it's, if it's possible, if, if you find a uh, worker-owned co-op brewery in your area or someplace close enough that you could possibly end up getting a job there um it's all it's a uh, it's way easier to join a functioning and already going co-op than it is to start one but even if you do want to start one it's still that's a great learning experience for how to yeah and some some companies um are willing to become a co-op they just never heard of the model mm -hmm. it could solve mm -hmm. that legacy issue I'm coming across yeah. more people who are having that legacy issue and the succession issue where oh, yeah. I don't know who's going to take over. They're already retiring and all the boomers are aging out and uh, kid, kids don't want to take over the company or some of them are already on board that it would be fair. If the people who are working there have more control somehow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, there's a great uh, preserving legacy businesses through worker co-op conversions uh, that we posted with a transcript uh, a while back uh, from Rob Brown from the from CDI uh, Cooperative Development Institute giving a talk to a bunch of uh, you know business owners you know looking to retire and, and convert to worker co-ops. Great um, educational uh, you know resource for anybody looking to do that. Um, but yeah, as the baby boomers are aging out, um, and just as, you know, a lot of people are figuring out, eh, it's not actually great to be a boss any more than it is to get bossed, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's a lot of people who are looking either to convert to get on the way out or to convert in order to grow the business and, uh, you know, keep it going, but without having to be the, the sole owner manager um type so yeah um and one of the things rob mentioned on that oh, i wanted to point out is that he said a lot of people you know they you made your business and it's like been your life for so many years you know decades and you decide you want to sell it and so you put it on the market and you and you have a number in your head as to what it's worth right and then you find out what it's actually worth and if you're living in a place like I am in kind of a rural area, you're also going to find out nobody's really interested in, in buying it who doesn't already live there. Um, so, you know, people, people's options are, are often very limited and your, your workers can often be the best, the best buyers uh, for you. So at any rate, on to the next one, this is going to be a short episode. I said, we only have three questions. So, Feel free to riff, Chris. Um, family Fun Account 420 says, how do you find people to start a co-op with? 
I used to work at a place owned by a co-op and watched it get run into the ground by people who couldn't handle confrontation and put personal ethics above good business practices. I love the idea of a co-op structure, but it's clear not everyone is a good business partner. How did you find your partners? Were they friends first? What is your story? So, sorry, I should just scroll down there. What, Chris, do you have any... Any thoughts about this before we scroll down for people's stories? Um, yeah, I was thinking about the shit shows that I've been <laughs> part of and that I've seen. Um, I'd say vetting. I don't know. I think that's part of it. Some type of vetting process, and you can't be too... I don't know. With some people, it seems they get lucky, and they find like cool people right away. Um, but then other folks, they, they bet. And then other folks, it's just this ongoing uh, battle. Battle mm -hmm. living in the co-op. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, vetting people, I think, is super important for my own part, personally, that I have learned that lesson on a couple of occasions now. Uh, the hard way, when you end up with somebody who you know, seem basically cool and maybe a little bit off base to begin with, but you know, you think, oh, well, you can work with this, and and uh, you find out, you know, a year or two years down the road, like, oh no, it's you know, things are way worse than than I thought. And so for me, like, I'm not really interested anymore in trying to start cooperative stuff with people who I haven't already known and worked with on in some capacity, even if it's just like going out for a hike you know but it's like i need to have spent time like a good bit of time with that person um before i'm you know comfortable saying like you know maybe we should we should think about uh, co-op stuff and there are a lot of you know people that i know and like friends that i have who you know my best friends for years and years and years who i wouldn't start a co-op with because i know enough about them like i know their mentality and the issues that we would run into and i'm not interested in in having those. Um, on the other hand, you know, if I was in a different, you know, place, I might be because, um, you know, it, it really depends, you know, he talks about his, you know, seeing people run into the ground, obviously, if it's a worker co-op, and it can't, you know, pay its bills, that's going to be an issue. Um, but if it's a housing co-op, and it can pay its bills, and you're having conflict with your um, other, you know, co-op members, uh, you know, that can be crappy but you also have to keep in mind that nothing is perfect and think about the problems that you're having in your co-op compared to the problems that you could be having in some corporate owned or privately owned um housing situation you know or just co-op in general so i do you know think that's important to keep in mind that while yeah there are issues and problems with co-ops um i would prefer i prefer the problems that co-ops have to the problems that you have to deal with uh, in non-cooperative businesses because at least in a co-op there is some type of possibility to for the members to actually have a have an effect and the people like employed there working there to have a to actually change it whereas you know when i was working at the nursing home owned by the sage corporation there was you know absolutely nothing we could do to change anything so i would rather have a problematic co-op to be involved with than a um than a private business because they're always problematic too it seems like anyway chris uh shall we scroll down i guess sure Read people's stories here um uh, let's see i know someone who tried to start a few and eventually gave up yeah i'm not real concerned with that story i also know people who tried tried to start a co-op and gave up and they talked to them and you're like oh it's because you have no idea <laughs> what you're talking about people didn't want to get on board with your bizarre ideas about what a co-op should be um so not to not to downplay whatever that whoever that person was but uh, let's see um, do we have somebody who actually started a co-op no okay that we got into it with a guy who's was not yeah um 
Well, there, there's this one comment that you passed up, and it was talking about how it's it's about the same as with any type of business uh, to find the good partners. I don't know if that's the case, because one thing I find in my life is that people are, like, ready to take orders. And I'm not the person, like, there's, there's some situations where I, I do give orders out, especially in emergencies. But there's a lot of other situations where I don't, I don't want to be giving orders. I don't think it's appropriate. I think that like we all need to be, um, unless we have an agreement, we all need to be pretty dynamic and participating. And um, there we go. Mm. That's one of the challenges I've seen with the co- with co-op and cooperativism. Yep. Yeah. I mean. It's having, I, that's the same thing. I noticed that the, the kombucha worker co-op now failed, um, that I, you know, I was uh, like a, just a pro se member on the board and kind of trying to help them out. And, um, despite me, you know, my proddings, they always kind of had this dynamic where one guy just kind of ran the show and everybody else just kind of nodded and went along. Um, not necessarily because they didn't want to have any role in decision making but because his personality was so strong they didn't want to you know put up with the nonsense that was going to ensue if they actually pushed back too hard on anything that he wanted and it did ensue at any time he got any pushed back um and so you know having the right types of personalities they're going to be able to work well together is definitely definitely a thing uh yo hi gal who has started two uh, tech cooperatives, the San Francisco Tech Collective and now and then the Boston Tech Collective. Um, says, for the first one, I met folks at my old workplace the first time around. And for my second co-op, I posted on Craigslist in a local worker co-op listserv. So, you know, doing a tech support. I think they do mostly tech support for just like, you know, regular people bring in your laptop or whatever. It's like geek squad kind of stuff. Um, and so, yeah, he's, you know, posting on Craigslist for other people with those skills who are interested in co-ops, you know, there you go. I mean, it's, uh, again, yo hi knew what he was doing when he did that. And I'm sure everybody got a good vetting and they all knew each other quite well before they started. But, um, let's see. Well, here we go. How well did you get to know people before starting to go into business with them? Oh, this is crazy, actually. First co-op, six months. Second co-op, no time at all. It was a risk and it paid off. There you go. Sometimes you get lucky. I wouldn't suggest that, even though I like you. I know him <laughs> and uh, am impressed with his co-ops. Like That one is like, you definitely took a gamble. But again, he was experienced and probably knew, had some idea that it was a good gamble. I also set up meetings and talk things over with the Craigslist people, ran some exercises and so on. There you go. Um, so, yeah, you know, we don't, I guess Craig's, Craigslist is the new want ads. But if you have any like, you know, local um, news sites or anything like that, that post have posts for this kind of in search of things. Yeah, it can be a, at least a way to meet similarly inclined people in your area um yeah he says not everyone is used to being an owner or being empowered and there can be huge knowledge and skill gaps it's it's cool that there's this iw presumably an iww member Mm -hmm. so interested in this stuff because i've taught i've tried to talk to the iww about co-op stuff i wouldn't get any responses from the organizing department board i believe um local and the regional well uh, the nara not not north north america regional administration i think i didn't see any interest that's a, that's cool seeing that <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah that's great uh to you know you've got um people everywhere who are interested in in the co-ops but yes the business planning um marketing as it says financial forecast all these things are important i would add to this i mean this is important boring stuff that people do want to skip over the other stuff that people want to skip over is conflict resolution bylaws um and and just uh also 
getting over like really letting the cooperative ethos sink in. I've noticed with a lot of folks, it is really difficult to get over the idea that if we're having a, we, we have a meeting, we're trying to make a decision and there are like, I, I came with an idea in my head to the meeting and I've proposed it. And now somebody is, you know, it's, it's, it's either like, people have the idea that it's either an up or a down vote, right? And I'm going to try to convince everybody that my idea is the best idea. And then somebody else is going to try to convince everybody that their idea is the best idea. And then we'll vote on it. And it's like, that's all very unhelpful in a cooperative meeting context, like getting over this idea that um, we need to pick the best idea. Whoever came with the best idea, then we just get together and pick who's got the best idea rather than we're all getting together to put our heads together. So, um, and come up with something that's going to be better than any one of us alone would have ever come up with. Uh, something that I don't know how you really spend a lot of time on that, but I think that's part of just meeting and working with people, knowing them before you get involved too much, unless you're yo high and you want to gamble. I don't know. One of my favorite things is uh, when, when uh, someone comes with an idea and we're like, okay, let's run with it. Um, but let's check in on it you know, in a few weeks time to see if like, if it's, if it is a good idea or how we got to uh, modify it. And then we actually do revisit it, whether it's by that person's initiative or someone else, it comes up in conversation. We're like, Oh yeah, let's, um, you know, let's reconsider that. Let's, let's adapt. Um, but what, one of the things I was thinking in regards to this is for me, for me, it seems, it seems to me the most ideal thing is if you have a good understanding of like what are certain responsibilities um, like key response well all, all the response well if you articulate all the responsibilities it's going to get really long but like key responsibilities that are relevant to that industry or that economic function and then getting consent consensus from the person you know, if they can, if they're going to do it, they're going to learn it, you know, consequences if they're not feeling that stuff. Um, I think that stuff is really ideal. Um, that's what I'm learning from uh, my experiences. Um, so you can be in that situation where you have that information. That way there's like meaningful consent from everybody about what they're getting into. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and having a joint accountability, you know, being of the mindset, I think that as a co-op, when one of the members of the co-op agrees to do something, it's not just on that member to do it. It's also on the whole group to hold them accountable, to help them do it. Right. And, and so it's, um, you know, because you can definitely run into situations where somebody agrees to do something or something's supposed to happen and it doesn't happen. And, and then instead of there being any kind of accountability process or any, you know, uh, way to deal with that, things just kind of break down and fall apart and there's bad feelings and stuff. Um, so like in Geo, for instance, often when somebody says like, I will do X, they'll get like an accountability buddy or somebody will be like, okay, and I'll poke you the day before or the week before or whatever. And, um, you know, people sometimes ask for that, um, often ask for that um you know just to to help them be accountable it's like okay if if the individual members of the group are are failing in the accountability it's not an issue necessarily i don't think of those particular members it's a failing of the whole group right to have adequate and effective accountability um not just to like punish people who don't do what they say they're going to do but to you know make sure that we all get the stuff done um yeah so this guy says he found he's just started a co-op um it's a bit, he's started thinking about 2021 just started this last january so about three years um to get to start uh he found one with uh one of his colleagues wonderful former colleague who does the exact job that forms the core of the business uh, software engineering again and the other, a friend of a friend from years past who I stayed in loose contact with. Uh, she heard we were starting co-op and gave us a bunch of great advice. And they offered her a position. So there you go. Um, again, friend of a friend is good. 
somebody you already knew and kind of have some somebody to vouch for him, I guess. Um, in hindsight, they say, think about the kind of person you need as a co-founder and find the connectors that know them. Need someone who's in sales, marketing, business savvy, reach out to business schools and find their ethical student groups. Need someone ideologically driven who has experience in the co-op space, reach out to a regional co-op network or incubator. Need someone with a specific set of job skills, find what guilds and trade organizations they belong to and reach out. The big thing is to focus on finding networks and relationships. So many great people I've met were introduced through other people who were a link or two away in the chain. The more connectors you have in your network, the more likely you are to find the perfect connection. Um, seems yeah, like I'm, I'm looking cool. at I'm looking at the business school advice, and it reminds me of a conversation I was having with somebody uh, who's been successfully part of who's been part of a successful co-op for many years, and uh, they're saying that there's like this one business person. Um, they're not part of a co-op or at the time they weren't but they kept insisting on basically like very expensive legal compliant ways of doing things and they're like dude we don't have money like that um you're talking about like extra tens of thousands of dollars that we don't have and uh, and, and i told them i was like man that dude would not fare well in my neighborhood because in chicago i live i live in what it could still be the same thing uh very densely it's a neighborhood with like a lot of it's densely packed with people who are undocumented. I'm like, dude, the economy here, a lot of it is it's it's an it's an illegal economy. Um it's Dash on the barrel people, head. Yeah, people running businesses out of their garages and stuff. It's not permitted in Chicago. Um mm -hmm. running it out of there. You don't really see this in other neighborhoods as much. Um in Chicago. Um not legally compliant but like the the business person or the person that's like you know coming out of the business school you know they probably have problems with that oh, so yeah. i don't know there's some, something important to share though if like if you're broke or whatever sometimes you're not, you're not gonna be able to do that stuff and that, right yeah you good. definitely yeah need to be connecting with people like this guy is they're doing software engineering so you can imagine probably a certain uh, socioeconomic class of people um, much more into the uh, the system as it is, and it, it's working for them. So that made sense uh, for him. But uh, rather than going to you know the business school, it's still the it, the kind of overall advice I think is still sound. Find networks of people who have those skills that you're looking for. So that might just mean knowing the right barbecue to go to where the guys who work on, you know, cars are hanging out, right? If you need a mechanic or whatever. So um, shout out to Pelham Auto uh, in, <laughs> in Western Mass, uh, one of our worker co-ops, uh, auto garages. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, do that. But, um, you know, Jim Johnson, one of the things that he... Uh, has said many times and is that you know he's been a co-op developer for a long time after being now after being a worker owner for quite some time and he's his view is that as a developer his job is not to tell people what they need to do to start their worker co-op his job is to give them all the options to lay them out for them make sure they understand what each of them is and so you know if you're working with somebody who's uh you know gonna you know an outside party nonprofit or, or just a, a random person um, who's, you know, trying to help you with worker co-ops, just keep that in mind. The idea of what you're looking for is somebody who can just help you figure out what the different options are, um, you know, and uh, some of those, you know, can be cash on the barrel head, uh, <laughs> you know, a gray market economy um, options. Um, at, and some co-op developers would not, you know, be comfortable mentioning or, or, or saying anything about that. But I mean, some of us are realistic and uh, n <laughs> know what the, the actual situation is for people. So um, we do what we got to do to get our needs met. Um, so, yeah. Anything else on that, Chris, before we head on to the next one? No, I'm good. Thank you. All right. I think you might have have some personal knowledge about this one, Chris. I don't know. 
Organizing work. Why do consumer co-ops hate unions? Examples from the U.S. in this article. Um, I don't know. Uh, this is from Malatesta Fiesta. It says, I don't know if one can generalize from these examples, but the examples are striking in themselves. I think co-ops harbor great potential for being both worker and consumer friendly, but it's not an automatic thing. Uh, Maybe obvious. In parentheses. Um, well, first off all, yeah, you can't definitely can't generalize from a few examples, but it is certainly the case that there have been some rather high profile examples of consumer co-ops, whether that be REI or um, some food co-ops that have had uh, not great relations to say the least with uh, union organizing efforts among their employees. Um, so grocery co-ops exploit workers, that's a rather broad statement, um, but may be true in, to some degree in some cases. I don't see any uh, Seward Community Co-op. Yeah, this was one that kind of made the news. Um, so uh, we don't need to probably dive into the details of any one particular incident. Cooperative principles are empty slogans. Well, they certainly can be if the members don't you know, make them a, a real thing. Co-ops are vicious union busters. Um, centralized and corporate. Again, these are all very, very broad statements. Definitely could be applied to something like REI, cooperative, I am, you know, but not necessarily to every single co-op out there. Use democracy to give workers the runaround. These, of course, are all consumer cooperatives. Um, so, yeah, there have been some union organizing efforts that have gotten a considerable amount of pushback from management at different food co-ops and consumer co-ops. Um, in the case of something like REI, I'd say it's because the management is very corporate in their mentality. You know, they have a CEO who they pay millions of dollars a year. They... Um, you know, just think about themselves, I think, mostly as a corporation and the co-op part is mostly marketing and it's just like a, a cash back program. Like, they, I don't think that their management thinks about it, like the corporate management, any, their membership, any, really any, probably any differently than like Target would think about a, a cash back program for their, you know, customer loyalty program. That's, you know, typical buy one, buy 10, get one free kind of thing. Like, there's not much difference between that and being a member at REI. Um, Apart from, we supposedly, you know, can vote for things, but, um, or on board members uh, occasionally, but not many people do. And yeah, in practice, they've shown themselves to be not union friendly at all. Um, in the case of grocery co-ops, my take on it is there is a lot of lack of communication, a lot of lack of information. I think that a lot of the problems at grocery store co-ops could be solved easily or more easily with the, you know, practice of like open book management, making sure that everybody sees all the money that's flowing through the co-op and knows where it's going and knows how much is going to the management and how much is actually available to pay in wages. Um, because the realities in grocery stores, it's a very low margin business. Um, and then, you know, you're competing with the Kroger's and the Safeways and the Albertsons, um, who can make that low margin work because they're so massive. Uh, but it's a lot harder to do when you're a very, you know, small scale independent, uh, food co-op. Um, and so sometimes I think there is like a real lack of understanding from the workers thinking that the business is way more profitable than it is. Um, and then I also think there's, you know, real lack of communication from the, from the management and the often, you know, are also coming out of the grocery industry and not used to, don't really have a cooperative ethos. They got hired because they know how to manage a grocery store, not because they're super cooperators. Um, but I think in all cases, it is incumbent on the membership to hold the leadership accountable, right? Otherwise, our co-ops mean nothing. Co-op democracy is just an empty shell and does mean nothing. Right. So um, 
I've, as a member of REI for a long time, just because that, you know, as a kid, I got signed up by my parents um, and have maintained it, you know, put, put my name on the petition um, to, you know, sent the, sent the strongly worded letters and whatnot. Um, but not a huge fan of REI. I don't know that I'll, I think I have a lifetime membership, so I don't, I don't think that I can not renew it, but I probably would be not renewing it <laughs> at this point. Um, anyway, Chris, stop me from rambling. So uh, I was, I, I saw that the REI, um, in Chicago is working with the retail wholesale and department store union. And I was looking at contact information because I'm trying to get an interview with them, but uh, I'm a little apprehensive that their social media is not being updated. So I'm hoping that that doesn't mean that the union effort has been crushed or anything. Um, and the reason why I'm apprehensive is because I, yeah, I have seen this. I get where some of the hatred comes from. Maybe they've seen this stuff. Maybe they have other stories that um, have not been told the same way that like I have some stories that they haven't made their way above ground yet. Um, yeah, like you said, uh, it's, it's what people are putting into it. But yeah, don't be illusion that working for don't have the illusion that working for a co-op means that it's going to be fair to you if you're in a yeah, honestly, in any situation. But uh, that definitely seems to be a phenomenon with consumer co-ops. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm hoping that if, if me and my friends join the um, shared capital, that we can try to influence shared capital to um, uh, incentivize <laughs> uh, hybrid co-ops um, and, and their lending practices. Because uh, it, it is a real thing. Yeah, there's also groups like the neighboring food co-op association um who i think would probably be amenable to conversations about like coming up with some kind of standards for for the you know consumer co-ops as a whole i mean i will say uh you know that we've gotten pushback at geo and i personally have gotten pushback from management at a particular grocery store co-op that will remain nameless uh, because we publicized some uh, you know, criticism over this, you know, anti-union uh, practices that were going on in this particular co-op. And in that case, uh, a group of members were trying to, you know, elect some new board members to change those policies. And uh, I got, a, got to have a personal conversation with the GM <laughs> from the food co-op. I uh, was not appreciative of us publicizing that. Um, nonetheless, you know, that's that's how democracy works. It's messy. Um, and so, uh, you know, kudos to those members for, for taking a stand on behalf of the, uh, the workers and using their ownership of the business to, to write that, um, situation, at least make an attempt. Um, but as I think this, uh, Dr. Moon or gun, uh, has responded. He said, I worked at a consumer co-op grocery store for 12 years, which unionized years ago. I've sat on two of the three rounds of union negotiations, once on the hourly side and once on the management side. A lot in this article resonates, but it's deeply cynical. It really paints the model as simply untenable from every angle, which is frustrating. Just like anywhere, things can go bad, and I and have in some places, obviously, but we only get extremely negative examples here. I think there's more nuance to what's being offered. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there are also food co-ops that are unionized, um, and, and happily so uh, it's definitely not a, not something that never happens. Um, but I'm kind of with you, Chris, I do think, uh, the multi-stakeholder model, like having in the bylaws, some type of, uh, some type of autonomy for the workers set aside and control over their uh, working, uh, you know, uh, environment and all that, uh, we, you know, separate board representation, separate membership share for the workers, that kind of thing. Um, I think is really a good way to go. Um, yeah. I like, I like Dr. Moonergun's comment though. P part, part of it too, is that, um, you know, if, if you can have 
freedom from in, from uh, like the rest of the union imposing stuff on the on the members. That is ideal to strive from and, and to strive for, and to not throw that idea out because um, if if a union, if you're I think that's something that people should be going for when possible to have uh, a union involved because a, a union does have a lot of benefits for for workers um, and they might know markets that that could be really important for the survival of like a hybrid co-op if mm -hmm. you know if that, if that is successful um, yep. though of course you <laughs> should be critical of unions too I think because um, I mean, they get in, they get in bed with the government. They're, you know, and and the unfortunately, a lot of the economy is jobs that are extractive. Um, you know, work. You know, the unions participate too in a destructive economy. Um, it's mm -hmm. we're we're in this big mess that we have to navigate, and you know, unions are part of that too, no exception. Yep. Um, that's why if you're thinking about unionizing the grocery co-op that you work at, go with UE. UE seems to be a good, a good union. Um, you know, IWW also, of course, uh, on the, on the better side of things, but I think UE is a little bit more, um, organized and a little more, um, uh, I guess not really, more of a traditional union, uh, but with some very strong democratic culture. Um, and they do already represent some other grocery co-ops. So uh, I'm a fan of UE from what I've heard and seen. In Chicago, yeah, they helped. Well, when I went to visit the New Year Windows Cooperative recently here in Chicago, mm -hmm. um, they still had the UE banner. Um, in their office, so it seems like it's ongoingly good there. Yeah. Um, and helping that co-op out. Otherwise, I think I'm pretty sure they would have torn it down <laughs> a while ago. <laughs> um, but yeah, when it when it comes to to that stuff, I would also see what you can do to kind of vet the local unions as well. I mean, yeah. I, I think that um, so in Chicago. Uh, Sometime in the past 10 years, there was um, a unionizing effort uh, here. It was uh, called the Mobile Rail Solutions Campaign. And mm -hmm. uh, some of the workers, they chose it to unionize with the IWW because um, they wanted, they, they didn't want to have the type of control that the other unions had, that they were seeing. They wanted like more freedom. Um, Unfortunately, though, a lot of the members, IWW members who were not part of, the, of that workplace or that those workplaces, because it's a bunch of rail yards that are scattered all over Chicago. Um, those people just really destroyed that campaign. Like <laughs> a lot of those people destroyed the campaign. Um, the, mem the IWW members themselves. Yeah. Um, so. I would really vet the local unions. It's, it's I'm not saying all the IWW. Uh, locals are like that, and 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 also the those IW members then are totally, for the most part, different from the IW members in Chicago now. Um, right. But I'll be looking out for that to vet vet the unions to see, yeah, you know, who's there and how long they're gonna stay because you know people, yeah the people could change. Um, and if, and I don't know if I've shared this in the past, but. One of the takeaways of that union campaign, though, because ultimately it failed, and mm -hmm. it, it, it could have been won if it wasn't for that, for those IWW members sabotaging mm -hmm. things. Um, but yeah, that that union campaign it was kind of celebrated throughout the world because they went on strike, and when they went on strike, it cost like Union Pacific a million dollars a day. Um, but in, in reflection, one of the things that that uh one of the organizers was saying is like man it would have been so much easier if we actually just formed another company basically a worker co-op he was he was describing mm -hmm. a worker co-op and just outbid outbid the current employer because it's, it's a contract and yeah. like, we could have got it we there he was like he was very certain they could have gotten it uh, one they would have actually been in legal compliance because mm -hmm. at at that time uh the employer uh 
yeah, there's like certain legal things that like Union Pacific and the other rail yards expected of the of the person who had the con the company at the contract, mm -hmm. and their employer, you know, they they weren't in compliance, and um, they're like, yeah, we could have got everything in compliance, and that that could have been the thing that one of the things that we said that we have that the other com employer doesn't have, or just fold, yeah. like let pull out, let the other company fold right away during mm -hmm. um, the renewal of the contract. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or, I mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a good model. He said, you know, brought it up a couple times now, but the uh, Wisconsin Natural History, or no, I'm saying it wrong. Anyway, Natural Heritage, Natural Heritage, the Wisconsin Natural Heritage Cooperative. They, uh, you know, did exactly that. They were employees for a nonprofit. Uh, nonprofit had change in management and leadership. They didn't like it. That nonprofit just had one big contract they got through the state to like go out and count birds and stuff. And all the people doing the work were like, hey, we don't like the managers anymore. They're screwing us over. Why don't we start our own company and just get this contract for ourselves, which they did. And uh, yeah, so there was another opportunity there. Sounds like a missed one, but something to keep keep in mind if you work for a company that you know is dependent on especially just a couple big contracts and uh you know how to do the work and you can figure out how much they're bidding and you know do the math and figure out how to underbid them which shouldn't be hard with you don't have a profit margin to worry about um yeah good way to do it um i will say if the company you're working for is publicly traded you probably don't want to conspire with your coworkers to all quit on the same day to tank the company because the SEC would have issues with that. Um, but <laughs> apart from that, like, yeah, the company needs the workers more than the workers need the company often. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I, don't, I don't know if that would have been tenable. Um, just leaving the company the formation of a new company i don't know if it was a public publicly traded company i mean unless it's pretty good size it's probably not i mean not many people are trading stocks uh but i, I wonder how wisconsin natural heritage did it i mean if the, the state is, is it oh hmm? is the exact timeline of how they did things on that interview you have with them the exact or, timeline? not exact yeah timeline, yeah, yeah. Pretty good timeline. yeah yeah i i mean i think they did it within like a year you know, it was like, okay, you know, the grant comes up every, you know, whatever the, the date was. And that was, that was what set them, what gave them their timeline for, hey, we need to get, you know, get this thing figured out um, because the grant renewal cycle is coming up and we want to be able to outbid them. And so, you know, they uh, started having meetings and got themselves organized and figured out, you know, I mean, they were all like work from home, a lot of them anyway. And we're only, you know, in the office at every so often. So it was really easy for them to do. They didn't have to necessarily think about, you know, finding a brick and mortar location and stuff like that. So they definitely had some benefits that made it easier for them. Um, to this follow is the article off. I'm referring to. Yeah. In but interview. when Kim Grevels, I believe is how she pronounces that. Although don't quote me on it. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, that was a, it, yeah. So it, but they had, if I remember correctly, I mean, it was over the course of several months, definitely less than a year from when they started talking about it to when they all got the grant and pieced out of their nonprofit jobs, um, to do the exact same thing just for themselves. All right. All right. Cool. Well, somehow managed to yap for 50 minutes, about three questions. Um, thank you for joining us and we will see you next month with more Reddit Q and A.